Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Cheeky Natives. It's your girl Alma Alicia, aka Dr. Slay, aka one half of the phenom that is the Cheeky Natives. Um, sometimes you just need to hype yourself. We have a very, very special guest on today's episode. We have. Are you guys ready for it? Dun, 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 dun. We have Litu Dumalinga Nim Um I could introduce him, but I think it's so much cooler when authors introduce themselves. It's always a little bit interesting to watch them squirm. I think they're a lot more comfortable with introducing their characters than they are with themselves. But I, I'm sure Litu Dumalinga is going to give this a fair shot. Let's go. 30 seconds. Who are you and why are you on the show? I have no idea. <laughs> Um, my name is Lututu Malingani. I am a, primarily a writer, but I also make some photographs and I make some films. So I've been listening to a few of your interviews and in almost all of your interviews you introduce yourself as a, as a writer, as a filmmaker and as a photographer. If I had to remove those three adjectives from your introduction, how else would you like to be known or to be thought of? A huge soccer fan. <laughs> that's pretty much it, really. I mean, there's a, you know, I, I suppose that's kind of like the work that I do. Mm. But besides those things, I, I, I'm also trying to be a father to a five year old son. Um, I'm trying to be a friend to, <laughs> to people, which I've not always been. I've just always been kind of been in my house and, mm. and writing and reading and watching films. So outside of that, I suppose you'll have to position me in the context of other people that mm-hmm. exist in my life. And because that's also um, quite an important thing for me, the relationships that I have with people and that, you know, that would be me, I suppose. But so you were on a panel sometime last year where you spoke about um, decolonizing, decolonization. And I'm particularly interested in what you think is the role of literature in the decolonization project. Is there a role for literature? Um, on a podcast that we had earlier this year, someone said that we, we overestimate what art can do, right? Art doesn't, art doesn't change lives in the ways that we do. Art doesn't change laws. Art doesn't change people's fundamental living conditions. Art is beautiful, but it's, it's pretty. It doesn't, it doesn't do real work. Do you have a counter to that? Yeah, I mean, that's always been kind of like the accusation uh, with poetry, you know, people are just like, it's beautiful, but to what end, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I, I suppose if you think about it and, and, and want to propose that art or, you know, the kind of beauty that exists in art doesn't really change lives, I, I suppose that's true, right? Mm. I mean, I don't, but I don't know if it's supposed to. I don't know if that's the role of it. Mm. But I do think that in, in the project to decolonize the kind of characters we see in books, the kind of stories that we read, I think literature becomes important because then we can begin to read stories that reflect us, you know, stories that, you know, the experiences are experiences that we recognize, right? Even if it's not your own life, but it's someone that you know or someone that you've encountered. So I think in that way it's important. But I don't know if it's going to suddenly end poverty. <laughs> yeah. right? I don't know if it's suddenly going to end the kind of ills that we have as a, as a society but it definitely offers an opportunity to write about those things and then have those conversations which I think as a writer and, and, and as a kind of a person who's interested in conversations I think conversations can go a long way in figuring out what to do with a situation and then that kind of figuring out can then link into other kind of physical things we can do or, or actual things that we can do. But I, I certainly think art is important in kind of instigating mm. conversation and ways to, you know, to change, uh, you know, people's conditions, I think. So you mentioned that you've always written or engaged with the written word. And from what I understand, you were a poet first and then you became a writer and pulling out the archives. Um, why, so the, the question I suppose is twofold. Where did your interest in writing and in literature begin? And why did you make the move from poetry to, to writing fiction? I mean, so I, I mean, I don't know if I've always written. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really became interested in, in the written word or literature, poetry, when I was in metric, mm-hmm. right? And that's, that's the only time I thought this could be, this, 
this could be a thing I can do, right? <laughs> okay. And that was the only time. So, I, I don't really want to talk about my poetry days. I feel, I feel like kind of like it's a dark secret that I've not managed to keep to myself. <laughs> and now it's out there and I'm like freaking out because people want to see the poems. And I'm just like, you're not going to see those. Okay. So I think poetry, poetry for me continues to be the love of my life. You know, mm-hmm. even, even when I read literature, even when I write literature, even when I write anything, even when I make images, poetry matters to me. The mm-hmm. beauty of something really matters to me. So that kind of love for poetry has always existed. Though, I, I mean, I stopped writing poetry a long time ago because I, I got really frustrated with what we were doing with the poetry right i i was wondering there was a point where i would go to poetry sessions and i'm meant to perform and then i listen to people before me and i'm just like but what are we saying Mm. right like what are what is it that we uh can you can you like you know can you listen to a poem and kind of does it capture any sense of society Mm. does it capture any sense of our being in the world and i felt the poetry that i was listening to exposed to was not and so I was like, you know what, I need to find something else to do. And that's when I started writing nonfiction because I felt like that was kind of like really capturing people's narratives more than poetry was. But I do like the beauty of poetry, but not so much the message that, that's often contained in some poems, which sometimes actually is nothing. You know? So why do you write? I always find that to be an interesting question for authors. I think different people have different motivation for writing. But why do you continue to write? Because I need to pay rent. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a difficult question to answer, you know. Um, but I, I think for me, the, the, the kind of ultimate last thing that happens when I decide to sit down and write is, is the kind of complete sense of being overwhelmed by a story right Mm. this kind of sense that i can't anymore ignore the story Mm. i have to put it down so i suppose for me that's kind of like the last straw of me deciding okay i have to write this down Um, but i suppose the other reason i write is because i love to tell stories and Mm. i feel that i feel that the stories that i want to tell are in some ways important to me and I have a sense that they could be important to at least one other person which is is all I hope for when I write that someone else one person out there can read it and kind of find some you know you know something to relate to or you know or something that kind of gives them a clarity about their own lives or about their own views so that's that's why I write so you won the Kane Prize for African Writing in 2016. Dun, 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 dun. I'm sure you're in six weeks in that. Which is phenomenal. I think that anybody who's familiar with the Kane Prize for Writing knows why that was an, a phenomenal feat. Um, I mean, so the Kane Prize has been critiqued by a number of people for encouraging a certain gaze with the prerequis- prerequisite for the manner in which the stories are written, the format, the language that the stories have to be written in. Um, how do you respond to that kind of critique as someone who's participated in the Kane Prize and done well? So I, I'm slightly not interested in kind of like this, this prescribed ideas about what, what writers should write. Mm. Uh, of course, I think when it comes to the Kain Prize, perhaps the, you can have the conversation about, um, as an institution, mm. it should perhaps give the prize to a kind of like very different stories. But for me as a writer, I don't know if I want to write differently just because the Kain Prize is awarding this kind of certain stories. Mm. You know, I write what matters to me, and I think that if the Kain Prize thinks that's a story worth awarding, and for any writer, I think it's important to really stick to what you are good at and what you are passionate about when it comes to storytelling. Um, and if the Kain Prize decides to award that, I think the problem is not so much for me, the writer, but the institution itself. Mm. Because of course we do, we do kind of need to to award all the different kind of of genres of literature that exist, mm. right? But I also do think that the Kind Prize has kind of done that, mm. right? So I think the, the the criticism will always exist, you know. And I don't know sometimes if it's always coming from a good place, <laughs> and I don't know if it's always coming from 
from people that actually should have that view, right? Because often it comes from people that have won the award and suddenly realize that, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So I, I, I honestly don't, don't have anything against it. And I think, and if I, you know, any writer who wins or is even nominated for the current prize, it does wonders for your writing. Mm -hmm. And it's really up to the reading public to decide whether they're not interested in your kind of story or are interested in your kind of story. And you know, speaking of it doing wonders for your writing, what has winning the Kane Prize done for for you? I get to be on a Chicken Eaters podcast, <laughs> right? Too <Touché. laughs> Um So the one thing that I think for me as, as a writer, and I, and and I suppose I mean I can assume this for all the other writers is is that what you really want is for your story to reach a wider readership, mm -hmm. right? And what the Kind Prize offers is the kind of interest in, in that particular story, but in your other work that you do. So I've, I mean, I've benefited from it because, you know, if I write something, people are interested to read it. I mean, I'm, you know, probably going to get to this later. I'm currently working on a book and people are, are just like, uh, we can't wait. We really can't so wait. So it, it both <laughs> kind of offers that kind of interest in your work. Uh, but also it puts you under a lot of pressure. What kind of pressure do you think that the, the expectation has changed since winning the Kane Prize? Is there more pressure to perform, to write at a certain standard? Or have you just gone about your memory as you would have before? I mean, I would be lying if I said I've just kind of completely not mm. thought about it, you know. Um, but also it gets to a point, for me it gets to a point where it's 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 you know, like I said earlier, you feel a sense of overwhelmed, mm -hmm. you know, by the story. And I, and often for me, that kind of sense kind of overpowers the idea that people are kind of waiting to read this thing, right? I mean, if I decide to write about soccer, which I have done, I'm not <laughs> thinking that are people going to be like, what the, you know, what is yeah. he doing, whatever. And it's just like, it matters to me, right? And I think for me, every time I read any kind of text, I'm really interested in the, in the honesty of the writer. I'm really interested, if the writer is interested in this text, I'm going to be interested in this text. So that's, that's kind of like where I depart from, this kind of idea that, you know, of course, you know, there's the kind of pressure people are waiting for this, mm -hmm. but this matters to me. This matters that it comes out exactly the way that it has, you know, that I want to capture it, the way that it's, it's you know, it's arriving to me and I need to kind of, you know, put it down. You talk about stories mattering to you. Is do you remember the first story that mattered to you that you read and you were like, yeah? It could even be a book or piece of writing that you read and it clicked in your head, like this is what writing should look like. So there's two books for me that are, are really important, you know, or at least that when I think about, you know, that question, you know. So there's a book by Chinua Achebe, which is a children's book called uh, Chike and the River, which I read a long time ago in primary school. And I remember it had like these little kind of drawings of this skinny kid in a village. And I was just like, I'm, I'm that skinny kid in a village, right? And then there's also this Tosa book, jeez, uh, I can't remember the author now, but it was called Inzali Namanyana, which, uh, which basically translates to what? To like, jeez, uh, like the, the extent that people would go to, to fight poverty. So the story was about these two women who were stealing babies to sell them, right? Because they had no other ways of making a living. And I remember reading this book and I remember reading this story and being completely just like, this is the most epic thing. It was just amazing because, I mean, you know when you read the book and you kind of have this kind of, it creates this kind of a world in your head and you can like see these two women, you can see this world, and you, see the, you know. So I remember reading that book and thinking, this is amazing, this is like... Of course, the story is devastating, but also like I can see this thing, mm. and so that for me were like the the, the two books that I, I remember. I'm really curious uh, about the short story that you wrote, um, "Memories We Lost." You speak about the inspiration behind it being your friend's father, who is then suffering from Alzheimer's. Um, what what about that story piqued your interest? So, I, you know, I think. This is actually the second time someone points this out to me and I've had to kind of uh, stage a little protest that it's, it's not really that one event. Mm -hmm. So I met 
I I knew about this. Well, the time I found out about this this you know from my friend was like like three years after I wanted to make a film about schizophrenia, right? Mm. So what's what really happened actually is that I was in film school, mm. and you know we were told that we need to kind of create the scene of some sort, and I was like, okay, cool. I want to create the scene of schizophrenia with these two brothers sitting in an office. And throughout the scene, the plan, you know, because I, I, I suppose I kind of overestimated my own intelligence, was to, like, write the scene that you can't yeah. figure out which one is has schizophrenia, yeah. right? Even though one is a doctor, but you can't completely kind of, like, yeah. you know. And that didn't work out. I sat down to write it. It didn't come out the way I wanted to. So since 20, 2011 mm. so I carried that story until I wrote the short story in 2015 mm. so the episode of talking to my friend and her father who's got uh, Alzheimer was part of a series of events mm. that led up to me writing the story so it wasn't that one event but it was a it was a couple of events and a couple of reading things and and um, which happens in the world where you're interested mm. in one thing, you read one article and suddenly the next day you're just finding all these articles that relate to it. So that's what happened. It was a series of events that led up to, to me actually sitting down to write the story. Okay. Um, so mental illness has sort of been a prominent... I think you've been asked a lot about mental illness and you're writing about it. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested in this in the setting in which you set the story. So the story was about a, a sister who, we don't want to give too much of the story away because we actually want people to read the story. But I mean, mental illness in the rural setting and all yeah. these sort of associated connotations that people have with, with rural settings. Why did you particularly choose yeah. the rural setting in which to set that story? So I, I cannot write a world that I don't know, right? Not cannot. I fail to write. <laughs> okay. I think far more imaginative writers can. But for me to write about a place, I have to be in that place, mm -hmm. and I have to kind of know, you know, the kind of topography and the the landscape, and you know. So it it sat in, in the village because I knew completely that I could write this world because I know this world. But it's also set in the village because what I really wanted to do was to kind of create a world of. Uh, traditional beliefs against mm. kind of like modern beliefs, right? And I knew that setting it in a village would, will allow me to do that. And that's why the story is set there. I mean, after writing that story, I've, I've realized that I've had to engage in conversations around that um, if you really look at the story, you know, what it's really about is people who are either not prepared to have the conversation mm. about mental illness. And that happens in the city. Mm, I mean, does. that happens in, you know, the many conversations we've had with our friends when you don't want to go out on a Friday night and they're just like, why, why, why would you want to be in the house on a Friday? And you're just like, depression, you know, you know the thing called depression, right? So that kind of, you know, that kind of relationship to mental illness exists in the city as well. But I couldn't write that story because I couldn't figure out Cape Town and how to like place it within that context, you know. Um, especially for that particular story, it wasn't working for me. So I had to set it in the village because I knew, I knew what I was trying to do, and I knew how to kind of write that. You know. Um, so you say that the portrayal of Afri of mental illness in African literature has been revolutionary. Judging sort of by the attitudes that exist, the argument could be made that it's not quite. Why do you believe that? The portrayal of mental illness has been revolutionary. I don't know. Did I say that? Yes, you said it in, in an, an interview. interview. <laughs> I deny this. Okay. I don't, I, I don't think it's been revolutionary, but I would say that I've seen that in the younger generation, certainly you know, people my age and people younger, mental illness has been a, a kind of an interest, and you see this from like photography. Um, there's a, there's a good friend of mine, Ella Gossa, who's an amazing writer, but an amazing photographer who did a series on anxiety. Mm. And it's the most beautiful kind of photography I've ever seen. Mm. So I feel like, and, and then there's other people who've written short stories and made films about it. I feel, I feel, I don't think it's been revolutionary, but I think that the younger writers and the younger photographers and filmmakers are beginning 
to accept that we live with depression and we live with anxieties and, and these are things that we can explore in our work and, and I think that's beginning to happen and so I think that's what I was trying to get to get to. So you won the Moreland Scholarship for writing. Please tell us more about it. Um, I think it's always really, it's really interesting to interview writers that have won awards and the like, because writers tend to be a very self-deprecating lot for some reason, um, regardless of the characters that you write. So just tell us a little bit more about what the Moreland Scholarship is. So the Miles Moreland Scholarship is a, is a prize that's that gets to, given to an African writer to work on a fiction or a non-fiction book. So I basically decided in December when they announced that they were accepting submissions that I was going to apply and I sent a little, they need like 400 words to describe the book you're writing and then they need published work. So I did that because there was I mean, I had been toying with the idea of writing a novel for a long time, and so I thought this is perhaps the opportunity to do it. And I had already taken time off any kind of uh, other commitments to work, so I knew that I would have the time to write the book, and then, and then so I sent in my application, and I got shortlisted, which was amazing, and then I, I was kind of off the internet when they announced the winners, so then I, I came back, and I was like, whoa. And it was, you know, it was insane to get that award and to actually begin working on my, what will be my debut novel, novel. hopefully. So your debut novel, is it still titled Let Your Children Name Themselves? It is. Okay. That's pretty much about the only thing that's not changed about it. <laughs> so. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about what your debut novel will be? And do you have a particular reason as to why that story spoke to you? So I try not to talk about what it's going to be because writing it over these past eight months now has really shifted my understanding of what I wanted to do originally. And so now I just don't tell people what it's about because then I'm going to be accused of being a liar when it comes out and it's nothing what I've been telling people. What's been interesting in that writing process for me has been this idea that sometimes stories tell themselves, right? And all you can do is try to kind of, you know, kind of shape it and channel it towards some kind of understandable, you know. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to write this book, but also the book is writing itself. So it's been, it's, it's been really interesting and I'm loving the process of writing the book. And, and, and I hope that when, when it is finished, it, it, it kind of reads as beautiful as I intend it to be. When do you plan to finish the book? So the scholarship is 12 months, so um, eight, months in. eight months in, left with four, no? That's four, right? Yeah, like 12 four. months in a year? Yeah, yeah, four. Yeah, so I'm left with four months, um, and, but so the, the draft, the first draft of the book will be finished in that four months, okay. but what I'm really excited about is the beginning of the rewriting and, and the editing process that I'm going to do after that. So that could, um, I hope that takes up to however long it wants to, because I'm, what I'm really after is to really write a book that um, not only well edited, but also well thought out, that mm. it's properly structured and properly planned, that everything kind of, kind of works in its own understanding of its own structure. So that's, I'm probably gonna spend a few months after I'm done writing trying to do that and uh, trying to harass people to read it and give me some suggestions. So. We would be more than happy to read it. I just want to put it on the record that the cheeky natives would That's be done. more than happy to done. read this book. Done. I'll send you a manuscript <laughs> when it's, once the first we, draft we is done. We actually cannot read. Um, so, you know, I, like, I want to know, I'm always interested in the writing process. I think, I think different authors have different writing processes. Um, what does it take for you to write? What are the ideal conditions for you to write a novel in? Do we need to get your private island? <laughs> that would be that would be great. <laughs> call should, us, call us in here. <laughs> yeah, that. So my 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 kind of ideal setup is silence. Mm. So I like I like I like to be alone when I write, and I like to 
have freedom of movement, so I like kind of, I write standing up sometimes, so I like to kind of like walk around and kind of have the sentence, you know, have the sentence in my head and kind of see if it works. Mm. Uh, I drink a lot of water when I write, so I'm constantly... Water, can we, can we just emphasize I'm kind that? kind of constantly trying to just drink water. Water, the dosen is very happy. Yeah, I mean, you know, so I drink water and I walk around and then I grab my pick, my camera when I'm get when I get really stuck and I and I leave the house and I take images outside, so that's my process really. It's just silence, water, and kind of space to move around. So you're a filmmaker and a photographer. Outside of the writing that you do, in what ways has has those two different art forms then influenced your writing? So much of my filmmaking has actually been writing, right? So much of the film work that I've done has been primarily writing and, and, and not kind of like directing films or whatever, uh, which I hope changes this year because I'm trying to make a short film. Um, it's, I don't know, I mean, it's kind of like interesting because I, I don't often think about it as kind of like completely different things. So, especially the photography, I think the photography for me has always been kind of a thing that when I, when I make an image, there has to be some kind of poetry to the image, right? And this is true for my writing, I always try to kind of have a sense of poetry. So I think in a way they're quite similar, even though they kind of work out, I suppose the, you know, the output is, is always kind of you know, uh, different, that one is an image and the other is text. But the concerns of how to produce those two for me remain the same. It has to be, it has to be beautiful. It has to be important to photograph, and it it needs to. I like tension, you know. I like kind of like those kind of like empty shots where you know anything can happen, as opposed to an image where something is happening, right? Because then there's no tension because already you know you've already captured whatever assumed tension we can assume it's already in there. So I like the kind of like, you know writing that something almost happens and this is true for photography a photograph that something is almost happening but it's not quite unfolding on the photograph in front of you so you've spoken about um the, the short film that you want to to release earlier this year um i'm curious as to whether you have a favorite child it's like asking if you have a favorite child or not if you could only do or participate in one medium for the rest of your life. So I'm basically asking you to pick your favorite child. <laughs> I could never. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't think I would ever. Mm. I don't, I don't think, I don't, like I said, for me, these things are, are quite kind of interlinked mm. in the way that I think about how to produce them. Mm. So I don't know if I could ever actually just choose one of them out of, you know, mm. um, I think if I ever were only able to write, it would suffer because I'm not making images and because I'm not making forms. And both the photography would suffer because I'm not writing if I only choose the photography. Mm. So I think in the way they kind of all feed into each other. And I think that's really important for me to keep doing all three of them because that kind of, that kind of really helps, you know, all of, you know, for them to exist and kind of mm. be clear about their own beauty and about their own concerns. Mm. So you've mentioned before that, that you think that the arts in this country and writers particularly need a little bit more support. Um, what, outside of prizes like the Kane Prize or the Moreland Scholarship, what, what are the other avenues that you think that would make writing a little bit easier for young black authors? Money would make <laughs> things easier. True right? story. So, I mean, the classic example is that the one at least the one kind of, of you know, kind of uh, money that you can get from government is 20,000 rand mm. to write a non-fiction book. Mm. 20,000 rand is not even a kind of a proper monthly salary. Mm. And if you think about it, how are you going to write a book in a month? How are you going to write a non-fiction book in a month? Mm. So for me, the, the important thing is, is, is to kind of get a kind of like really lengthy support for writers. Mm. And thinking about my own journey of the Khan Prize and the Miles Moller, if you remove those two, I don't know where I would get the money to sit at home and write. Mm -hmm. right? So it's really important to kind of not only think about once off prizes for writers, but also to think about how do you as a writer, you know, take time off work to write a book. Right? 
And I don't even know how that is sustainable when I don't know how many writers we have in this country. So how much money is going to go into these writers to write these books? Um, and so it's really hard to think about it. All I know is that writers need money to write, but I don't know how we regulate that. I don't even know how frequently that can happen in a country with all these people that are writing. Um, so I, 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 you know, I feel that you know, writers need to kind of work without these ideas of getting support from the government, even as we are trying to. The, the kind of default for me has always been the story has to be very important to tell, that even without that support, we still continue to tell the stories. It'd be great if we had it, but we don't. And, and looking at, at how things are unfolding in our leadership, <laughs> we are not going to have it for a very long time. Yeah, I hear you. Um, so before you, so I'm actually curious in, about your life, Prior to you having sat down to write this novel, to write the short story, I was just a regular Joe, just you know, just walking the streets and uh, <laughs> film, the film try, school, a regular try, film school. Trying, trying to like look, <laughs> trying to think about things. I before I wrote the story, I was in film school. Mm. Um, before that, I was involved in a um, in a kind of like a startup magazine. Uh, before that, I was a, I was a radio DJ. <laughs> Um, which didn't work out. I, I, you know, I worked at this community radio station. I was doing like a twelve to three show, you know, midday show, um, which in the beginning was lovely because I've always wanted to be on radio. And then it got to a point where I was completely bored. Like I could not get up in the morning to prepare for the show. And so that's when I decided maybe I should try writing. And so that's when I began to write. So that's what I was doing before that. But my life had always been a kind of trying to create things and trying to make things happen. Um, and, you know, before that short story, actually, I had been writing for, I had been writing for different publications. You know, I was writing, writing about music, writing about films, and writing, you know, non-fiction work. So that's what I was doing. So that's very interesting to me, right, that you've always sort of been involved in one medium or another in the arts from forever. How is... I think that there's traditionally a sense that African or black families don't understand the arts as a career. How are the, the people in your life, the elders, Lowell, how have they reacted to the idea that this is a full-time job, that you write for a living? Have your parents accepted that? So my mother has always been, has always been supportive, right? Mm. But her support is interesting that I don't know if it's so much that she thinks there's money in the arts <laughs> more than that if this is what you want to do do it mm. right so for her i don't think she completely understands it but she's always been a kind of person that if you want if this is what you want to do if you are sure this is what you want to do i will support you in every way possible mm. right yeah, but it, it's but it's interesting in a way because i was home in december mm. and people are still kind of like so so where do you work you know, and I'm just like, I don't know, actually. I kind of like, you know, here and there. So the understanding is still continuing to be kind of, people can't quite figure out mm. how, who pays you to write a book, mm. right? So those things are still continuing, but for me, it's, it's always, my mother has always been kind of just like, do what you have to do. I mean, if this is what you want to do, do it. When I said I wanted to be a radio DJ, my mother was just perfect. And then I went off and I studied and then I got bored and I was like, I don't. And she was like, what do you want to do now? And I'm just like, film school. And she was like, go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. And so my mother has always been kind of just trusted mm -hmm. my bad decisions, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> bad, bad decisions with good outcomes. True, true, <laughs> true. So I'm, I'm curious about the books that you are currently reading or the last books that you've read. Um, I'm always curious as to what, what it's like to read a book as, a, as somebody who writes books for a living. Do you think it changes the way that you look at books? Do you have a different appreciation for, for literature? Or is it just like, oh, this is a great book, let's keep it moving? I, th I think it does. I think it, often, I, I mean, I, I, what's happened in my life is mm -hmm. that I've, I, I, I seem to encounter these books that are far greater than I will ever be. Right. So it's always important to kind of read this this text and just like, whoa, like mm. how did this person pull this off? Mm. And so it's always been amazing for me to read these books and I, and I really admire writers who write like that and they just mm. read, 
you know. So, I mean, the, the one book that I always read is, is of course, Anne Michael's Fugitive Pieces, which is like, in my opinion, the greatest book ever been written, right? Mm. And this is a book that I return to constantly, and I often have to physically restrain myself from returning <laughs> to this book because I can't, you know. But I've, I've also been kind of consuming a lot of poetry because poetry for me is as kind of, you know, the juice that kind of gets me going. I read, I read a poem and I'm just like, whoa, right? Mm. Because also poetry collapses the ideas of genre that exist in literature, right? Mm. Like you don't read a poem and go, is this science fiction or is, you know what I mean? You read it and you just appreciate the beauty of it. And that has really helped me in figuring out my own book because suddenly I actually don't care, mm. right? I only care that the story is getting told, right? Mm. If you read it and go, but this is science fiction, it's like, well, that's what it means to you, but this happened to me, right? Mm. Or this happened to someone that I know. Mm. So that kind of helps for me. So Fugitive Peace is a book that I, I return to often. But I've also been reading, again, I forgot his name, but he wrote a book called... Uh, your heart is the size of your... Is a muscle the size of a fist. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Which is the most beautiful book? You're probably the only other person I know... It's beautiful. ...who's read that book. Mm. And who's the author again? Um, Sunil. Sunil Yapa. Sunil Yapa. Yeah. Sunil yeah. yeah. I love that you... You've now like moved up. Like your street cred is on. <laughs> because you've now read this book. Because I keep talking about this book and everyone's like, your heart is a massive mm. size of a person. It's beautiful. This Especially is... with oh the kind of gosh. context of protests that have been going on. Yeah. That book kind of like, yeah, that book. And the, also the, the way metaphors. it's written. The right? book is written right. really well, but the metaphors and, beautiful. and, and the, the complexities, right? So I think that each of those characters are complex. You know, he writes, yeah. he writes characters that require you to sit and think about and and the themes that the he explores, the and the son and the father. And the son and the father. Me, like, how do you even write a relationship like that? Right? It's how so do you imagine that uh, that relationship, yeah, or yeah. or the events that take place? I think that he chose a subject matter, which could have very easily been caricatured, you know. And yeah. he wrote it with such respect yeah. for for the characters. Yeah. So I I'm, I'm really impressed. Like I mean, I was impressed before. I <laughs> No, but, just like, okay. but I'm just like, when is this book coming out? You know, um, yeah, your your heart is a muscle the size of a fist. It's beautiful. Stay tuned for the podcast in it's which beautiful. we discuss that with one of our our favorite poets. Perfect. Can't yeah. wait. I can't wait. I love that she spoke about this book. I'm just like snapping my fingers. Everybody should actually read that book. It's beautiful. It's it's a it's a heavy book, but not heavy in the ways that we traditionally think about literature being heavy. But heavy for the ways in which it forces you to ask yourself questions. You know, because you, you read the book and you, you want to react, associate to the things that happen, but you don't. It, right, it, it kind of pushes the characters to an edge, right? To, the, to a certain point where you're just also they kind of like, man, I'm, I don't think I'm ready what's going to happen. And then it moves on to the next narrative. And, you know, it's, it's yeah, okay, let's move on from this book. <laughs> so, yeah, suffice to say that yeah. everyone should read this book. Yeah. Um, so is there, with that being said, is there a book that you wish you'd written? Any of the Ben Ockrid books, right? Mm, um, mm. Uh, you know, more so Astonishing Gods, I think mm. it's called. Mm. Um, definitely this Anne Michaels book, mm. Fugitive Pieces, which... I, I mean, I've read this book so many times and I just have sentences in my head from this book just kind of like roaming around somewhere there. So those two books, so, you know, those kind of authors for me are really, really incredibly um, amazing and, and, you know, those are the kind of books that I, that's the kind of poetry I hope my own book kind of, you know, that's what I'm attempting and I hope to some degree I kind of succeed in writing this kind of like beautiful book. Um, yeah. So you've mentioned before that you don't think that authors should be pressurized to write about certain topics um, no matter how urgent or how demanding I don't know the the topic might be why do you believe that authors should sort of be left to their own devices when it comes to choosing subject material I mean so for me I, I really love authors who write honestly and, and when I mean honestly something that you deeply care about mm -hmm. right 
I would hate to read a book that an author is simply channeling the pressures of society or the pressures of social media, let's put it that way. Mm. Right. So the, the thing for me that view for me comes from the place that I would love to read a book and completely um, that the, the author tells a story but the author captures their own kind of politics and their own frustrations. Mm. And if you're writing someone else's idea, then that does not come across, right? And so the, that for me is, is really important that writers are kind of like really, you know. And also the question of, you know, agency for me is it has to be what's agent to you, mm. right? Not what's kind of agent everywhere else, but it has to matter to you for it to matter to me as a reader. So you've spoken a lot about things having to matter in terms of writing. What matters to you when it comes to, to your writing? That it's beautiful and that I am honest in it and that in its beauty it captures the political landscape of where, of, of where the story is happening. Those, those things for me make a, a complete story. So um, you're from the Eastern Cape originally. Yeah. You've now made the move to Joburg and were you in Cape Town before this? Yeah, so I, I, I've been in Cape Town since 2013 okay. and I, I moved to Cape Town right after I graduated from film school. And there was an opportunity to work for a film company down in Cape Town. But also my son had just been born, so the immediate thing for me was to be a father. Um, and I, you know, Cape Town is a, is a loaded place, so I kind of made it work for those years. And now I feel like I, I needed to make the move to Johannesburg because I want to do other things which I am of the view that are not as easily possible to do in Cape Town. Yeah, so you you were talking about how you'd moved up to, to Cape Town. So did you grow up in the... Where did you grow up in the Eastern Cape? I grew up in a town called Zomo, in like a very kind of like a small village of not more than 200 people when I was growing up. Okay. Um, called Zikofane. So I, I pretty much grew up there and then I, I left to go study uh, I wanted to live my dreams of being a radio DJ, so I went to East London to study. And then after that, I, I lived in the free state for a little bit, because that's where my father is. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's where I became a radio DJ. And then I came to Johannesburg to study filmmaking, and then I left to go to Cape Town, and then I'm, I'm back in Johannesburg again. What do you... So this has been a really interesting podcast. I always, I always find it interesting to speak to authors I think we all have an idea of the author based on the story which is often not true or not realistic um, and it's always just interesting to speak to young black authors who are sort of making waves in their own very quiet self-determined way so what's what how would you like to be remembered as an author as a passing shot how would Jeez, you like that's to be? a uh, heavy heavy question <laughs> I think one you should prepare yourself for with with the book coming out with with the amazing short story that you've written with the great work that you continue to do. I mean, we've seen your images. I just saw an article that you wrote about football, and I was like, "Who's this dude making?" I'm not even. I think it was a boss. I was like a La Liga match or something, and I was like, "Who's this guy writing about La Liga that that makes it interesting to?" To people that aren't particularly interested in, in football, that was that's a powerful, that's a powerful skill, right? That you yeah, that you yeah. pique the interest of somebody who would not ordinarily be interested in the subject matter that yeah. you are obviously very interested in. Yeah, a, a friend of mine who's a who's a photographer, Kumuto uh, Neto, who is an amazing photographer, uh, said something interesting the other day, and he was like. I make images of these spaces so we can look at them differently, mm. right? And I think that kind of that's kind of the thing when I write is, is a kind of like I'm not writing anything no one doesn't know, right? Like, but the way that you write it so that people can stop and be like, even the Sunil book we're talking about, right? We, it's not like we don't know protest, right? It's mm. not like we're not aware of the complexities of protest. But you read that book and suddenly you just pause and you're just like, mm. whoa, I had never thought about it this, or I had never kind of extended this narrative to this point that this writer had. So I suppose that's kind of like the thing that I'm trying to get at, is to kind of write the ordinary in, in a kind of way that interests people and, and people can begin to think about, think about it differently. So that's, yeah. I, how, I don't know how I would like to be remembered. <laughs> I think I, I, 
for me, writing is, 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 is really my own obsession. Right? Mm. I, I write because I really love to, and because I want mm. to tell stories, and I make images because I want to. So I don't know if being remembered by other people mm. defines who I am. Mm. Of course, maybe you know, for archive purposes, it's important. But mm. I think for me, and I really appreciate the love people who you know kind of give me. But I don't know if beyond that I want anything else from people. Mm. I think I, I simply want to share the stories and I'm interested in, in people reading them and the conversations that come from that. But I would like to people to move on with their lives and do amazing <laughs> things and not to remember me at all. That's why for you like people to move on with their lives, do amazing things and, and not tell more stories. And tell more stories. Yeah. I feel like that could be a t shirt. <laughs> I'm staying tuned. <laughs> Um, with that being said, thank you so much for coming on to the show. I know you took time out of your very, very busy writing schedule to come onto the podcast, and we really do appreciate just the stories and the, and the, and the idea and the interest in these topics that you're broaching that previously haven't been spoken about in the ways that they have. We look forward to that manuscript, um, that advanced copy. I will print it out <laughs> and I will deliver it myself. And we are in Joburg and Kakunolo will be back from LA at the time of print. It will be done. And let it, it be, be from your ears, from your mouth to God's ears. It will be done. And thank you for this podcast. Not just this particular one, but for the idea to have black writers talk about literature and talk about the politics of literature. Mm. Which I mean, as we all agree that it's it's of a the years of our stories being kind of engaged in a very different gaze mm. has not completely been coming out the way that we intended to and this podcast allows for that and, and that's really amazing thank you so thank you to everybody for listening to this week's episode of the cheeky natives stay tuned for more from Lidu Dumalingani and uh, the amazing work which is to follow no pressure <laughs>